Hello, hello, and welcome to the seventh episode of Eyeshadow and Itihas. I am Ruchika Sharma, and before I say anything else, I would like to tell you that the channel in the past 10 days has gained 150 new subscribers, and my heart is absolutely full. Thank you so much for subscribing, you guys. And since so many of you are new here, I am Ruchika Sharma and I teach history for a living. I have a few more credentials that have been listed in the description box. As for the channel, Eyeshadow Nitihas is a passion project that brings together my love for eyeshadow, which is basically this stuff over here on my lids, and Nitihas, which is basically all things history. So each weekend, I talk about a particular topic of history while putting together an eye makeup look like this one. Please note that there is a list of sources pertaining to the topic that have been listed in the description box. In case you want to fact check everything that I will blabber over here or anything that I say sparks your curiosity and you want to go ahead and do a bit of an extra reading. Now that all that is done, let me introduce you to today's topic. Today, we will talk about the mosque next to the Qutub Minar in Mehruli, the Qutub Mosque. The Minar has already been discussed extensively in the debut episode of the channel. And in case that interests you, I will link that particular video here and also in the description box. So the mosque built next to the Minar is a curious example of architectural reuse, which as we discussed in the fifth episode of the channel, is something which is a bit of a common theme throughout the subcontinent's history. In case you haven't seen that episode as well, I link it here and in the description box. But what are the specifics of architectural reuse in this particular mosque? This we will try and uncover in two episodes. The first, which is this particular episode, will talk about the much notorious Persian inscription on the eastern gateway of the mosque and test its authenticity. The next episode, which will be episode 8, will discuss in detail the architecture of the mosque and see how it relates to the description given in the Persian inscription. And for today's episode, while discussing the Persian inscription and testing its authenticity, I will be putting together this particular hot pink eye look. Because this is hot pink. And you know what I say about being matching matching. Chale up here. The Qutub Mosque or the Congregational Mosque in the Qutub complex was built in three phases. The first phase, built by Qutubuddin Ebak, largely entailed of Ebak laying the foundation of the mosque and building most of its superstructure in 1195 AD, while also adding a screen to it in 1199 AD. The second phase was when Altamash or Iltutmish the successor of Qutbuddin Epoch extended the mosque to the north, south and the east sides, while the third phase entailed Alauddin Khalji not only further extending the mosque but also building a really ornate gateway to it called as the Alai Darwaza. In the first phase, the mosque was largely made out of reused material which, if you remember, was something that we discussed in great detail as a phenomena in the fifth episode of Eyeshadow in Itihas. However, the employment of reuse in the Qutub Mosque was largely viewed by the English in the narrow binaries of Hindu and Muslim. The English largely noticed the predominance of Hindu architecture employed in a Muslim building. This entailed, among other things, berating the ability of the Hindu craftsmen to make 
True dome and arches. What exactly is meant by true domes and arches is something that we will discuss in the next episode. The English also presupposed the idea of conquest, wherein the reuse of material was seen as necessarily violent and destructive, largely done in order to proclaim the might of the conqueror's religion. Hence, the insertion of the name Kuvvatul Islam or Might of Islam by Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan, which if you saw the debut episode of Eyeshadow and Itihas would know was a completely incorrect appellation to the mosque. The mosque when functioning would have simply been known as the Jama Masjid. Sayyid Ahmed seems to have misread the appellation used for Delhi by the early 13th century chronicler Minhaj Siraj Jusjani, who called Il Tutmish's Delhi as the Kubbat al Islam, a sanctuary or safe space for Islam. The term was used by Jusjani to explain this mass exodus of population of Iran and Iraq lands which during the 13th century were being ravaged by the Mongols, causing the settled population of these lands to look for safer places. As Juzjani informs us, il Tutmish posited Delhi as one such safe place, attracting many nobles as well as artisans displaced from Iran and Iraq to seek shelter in Delhi. These people introduced to the subcontinent new technologies like the Persian wheel and the spinning wheel, which will in times to come revolutionize farming and spinning. Now, our man Il Tutmish's efforts, brave and valiant as they were, were recognized by the Caliph at Baghdad, who gave him the title of Nasire Amirul Mumini, which basically translates to the deputy of the Lord of the Believers. It's quite a mouthful, but commander of believers or Lord of Believers, basically Amirul Mumini is the title, was the title of the Caliph. So this just means the deputy of the Caliph, Il Tutmish was so obsessed with this title, he literally put it on all his coins. I really just had to tell this story, although I know it's only partially related to the topic at hand, but it's a good story of how Il Tutmish earned the title of Nasiri Amirul Mominin and then he got the title of Kubat al-Islam. Anyway, the larger point being, the mosque was never named Kuvvat al-Islam and never even named Kuvvat al-Islam. During the time when it was functioning, it would have simply been called the Jama Masjid. Now the first phase of the mosque cannot be discussed without addressing the elephant in the room, the inscription on the eastern gateway of the mosque. Now the inscription tells us that the material used to construct the mosque comes from the destruction of 27 temples. Interesting, but like all other sources, one can't treat it uncritically. The inscription can be analyzed in two ways. One, the political milieu of Eberg's time, and the other, the architecture of the mosque itself because when discussing architecture it's always a good exercise to let the written word be and let the monument speak for itself and in this episode we will only be contextualizing the inscription in the political milieu of Kutubuddin Ebak's time. The architecture will be discussed in the next episode. Now, Kutubuddin Ebak was one of the three major military slaves of Shehab Khori, popularly known as Muhammad Khori. 
the other two slaves of Khori being Nasiruddin Kabacha and Tajuddin Yaldos. All three, Ebak, Yaldos, and Kabacha, were allowed to govern their dominions under Khori. Yaldos was at Lahore, Kabacha at Multan, while Ebak at Ajmer and Delhi. These territories were, however, not free from dispute, as Ebak did fight Yaldos in vain to get Lahore. This shows how the authority of each of these slaves could be challenged by other military slaves too. Now this is attested by Sunil Kumar, who informs us that even though texts written for Ebak, such as the Tabakate Nasiri by Minajus Siraj Jusjani or the Tarihe Fakraldin Mubarak Shah by Fakraldin Mudabbir, hail Ebak as Amirul Umra or the Lord of the Nobles and sometimes even Wali Ahed or heir apparent of Muhammad Huri, his authority went hardly unchallenged. Another military slave of Muhammad Huri, a person called Bahaldin Tughril, who was the governor of Bayana in Rajasthan, battled with Ebak for the seizure of Gwalior. In fact, Tugril was so confident of his position at Bayana that in the mosque constructed by him in 1204, which is the Chorasi Khamba Mosque, also made out of reused material, the inscription proclaims Tugril as Sultan. On a side note, it is this mosque, by the way, that features the earliest surviving minbar, which is basically an elevated place close to the mihrab where the king or the religious leader presiding the prayer sits. But back to Ebak. How does Ebak's precarious position vis-a-vis -vis other military slaves relate to the inscription on the mosque? Sunil Kumar argues that the mosque at Qutub was a project for Ebak to impress the Jamaat, the congregation of Muslims, while the inscription outside fashioned him a Ghazi, fighting the war for his religion. Note that the inscription written in Persian would not have been read by the residents of Delhi who did not know Persian, but also would have been completely illegible to the elite entourage of Ebak, whose primary language at this point of time was Turki. Eh? So why is the language of the inscription Farsi when the language of Kutubuddin Ebak and most of the people of his entourage living in Delhi at that point in time have their language as Turki. It is specifics like these that have largely been questioned by Barry Flood, such as the very precise number of 27 temples, which Flood tells us is the number of nakshatras in Puranic mythology calling the number 27 as largely connotative and not denotative. Now, before you get all confused as to what is this connotative and denotative, it's just randomly difficult academic speak for the fact that this number does not denote the number of temples in itself, but is symbolic of things which are representative of the Puranic mythology. That's all. And if it's still not clear, trust me, it will get clearer. The date of the mosque itself written in the inscription, that of 1191 AD, is in itself questionable. Because this is the date when Ghuri lost the first battle of Tarayan. If you remember the last episode of Eyeshadow in Itihas. In case you don't, I'll link it here. So 1191 was the year when Ghuri actually lost the first battle of Tarayan. 
how could then Airbuck have the control of Delhi and build or lay the foundation of this mosque? Coming back to the language, why was the language Farsi, which became the language of the text much later under Altamash, and even then the language of the working of the court still remained Turkish? In fact, another inscription, this time in Arabic, on the northern entrance of the mosque talks about how the mosque was built in 1195 AD, a date that seems to be much more plausible and realistic than the date given in the Farsi inscription. Now, Flood concludes that these anomalies point to the fact that the inscription is a later date addition to the mosque and does not tell the actual story of how the mosque was built, but how it was perceived to have been built by Ebak's successor, Iltutmish. Now, as the military slave of Ebak, Altamash had to struggle really hard to proclaim himself as the Sultan. Apart from a military prowess, Iltutmish also tried to gain clout by nurturing a close group of Turkish military slaves who would be loyal to Iltutmish in these tough times. And if that was not enough, our hard-working man Iltutmish also used architecture as a tool to demonstrate his claim to throne as being a fair one. By extending and embellishing the Kutub Mosque and the complex in general, Iltutmish appropriated the legacy of Ebok. Clearly then, the inscription was added by Iltutmish to showcase Ebok as a powerful military slave of Khuri, with Iltutmish or Altamash as his rightful heir. Specifics such as the amount of money spent on destroying the temples in the inscription is given in Dili Vals, which are details which are not given in any other inscription of the Sultanate. And this makes the inscription quite unique. Dili Wal was the currency in Delhi in vogue during Altamash's time. Airbuck's entry in the 1190s should have prompted him to denote the currency in dirhams, which is how it was denoted back home for Emak. And if none of this is enough, to put a huge question mark to the authenticity of the much talked about Farsi inscription, the architecture of the mosque tells its own tale, which further discredits the Persian inscription added to it at a later date. But that we will cover in the next episode of Aishalu and Tehas and look at how the material was reused and if that can tell us anything about where that material came from. Does all that recycling and reuse of material involve violent destruction? If not, what are the other ways in which material to be reused could be obtained? And even though the inscription may have been anachronistic to Airbag's time, there is no doubt that the material used in the mosque was reused. Who were then the builders or masons employed to build the mosque? Did that have any impact on the look and feel of the mosque? All of that in the next episode of Eyeshadow and Itihas. And that is all that I have for you today. In case any of this resonated, Please note that there are a list of sources written in the description box that you can use to do a bit of an extra reading or to fact check everything that I just blabbered. And before you just walk away, please like and share the video and subscribe to the channel. I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.